Good morning. We are going to get started this morning. Thank you for joining, um, joining us on our third session of our Dealing with Dementia series. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, talking about a caregiver toolbox and practical tips, tools and tips and approaches for caregivers um, who are caring for those with dementia. My name is Christine. I am your host for today. I'm with uh, Emerald Crest Memory Care. We are sponsoring the three-part series. Um, if you were on the other uh, two series or parts, you probably heard me talk before, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I just want to do a quick introduction of the Emerald Crest communities um, and where we're located. Um, we um, have four locations in the metro area. We have one in Burnsville, Minnetonka, Shakopee, and Victoria. We've been providing memory care in, in, for over 20 years. Um, and we have a really unique environment where we have one level houses that were designed and built specifically for those with dementia that have 12 to 15 residents in a house. And we have different levels of dementia care at each campus. So um, if you're interested and learning more and coming out and touring, I suggest that uh, you give Liz, our admissions director, a call. Her um, number is there for you and she can set up a time for you to come tour or even do a virtual tour if you're more comfortable with that. Um, so again, there are four locations uh, and a little map to it. So check us out on uh, the mlcrest.com website. So, um, did I skip a page? No, okay. All right, so we're gonna get started because I know um, our speaker today, Sarah, has some really great information and it's a lot of information. Um, we may go over the hour um, that we like to try to stick to. So hopefully that works with everybody to go maybe into an hour and a half, um, but there will be some great information you're gonna get from today's session. Um, Wanna remind you to keep the, uh, keep keep your, um, Keep it muted and keep your uh, video off so that we don't have any technical issues um, when we're also trying to record this for future viewing as well. Um, so we're going to get started. Let me introduce Sarah. Sarah did our first session on this series on forgetfulness. Um, is it normal or a warning sign? And she's going to continue um, with our last series. And so some of you might recognize her from the first one, but Sarah is our occupational therapist at our Burnsville location. Sarah has been there for over 16 years and she works very closely with um, the whole care team out at the Emerald Crest of Burnsville site um, and working with them to identify, you know, the challenges and gaps that the residents may have uh, due to their dementia. And then um, they create strategies and techniques to fill in those gaps so that they can have, um, can maximize the resident's abilities and level of function. Um, she does uh, cognitive assessments, behavior management, does a lot of staff training, and also oversees the activity program that we have at Emerald Crest as well. So we're gonna get started here and um, please welcome Sarah. Thank you, Christine, and thank you all for joining us. Um, again, like Christine said, I did the first uh, presentation here, and you get to you get to hear me again. And like Christine also said, um, I do try to be concise, but I may not keep this to an hour. So um, I have a lot of information to share. Um, the the series will be accessible via link. Um, you can always review that afterwards as well if we get crunched for time and I skip some things. But um, here we go. Um, our objectives for the the hour hour and a half here um, are really to help um, those of you that are caring for somebody with dementia um, in your own home or or wherever that may be um, to better understand the challenges that arise when somebody has dementia in things like communication, participation in activity and cares, and those behaviors that we'll encounter um, because 
um, of their, their challenges with communication. That's what we'll talk about um, throughout the presentation here. And then I will also be trying to share as many tricks of the trade as I can with all of you, um, common approaches that um, have been kind of tried and true in, in the work that I've been doing with my residents um, over the years that we that the other occupational therapists practice um, and uh, a train on at the other locations as well. Um, a lot of a lot of these approaches are are well known, but I'm trying to get them all summarized up in a nice little package here for all of you. So um, we'll kind of dive in starting here with a with just an overview of what dementia is. Again, if you were part of this series from the first um, session, I did spend quite a bit of time talking about what dementia is and what happens. So this is just going to be a, a quick review of that, um, but also a, a helpful review for those of you that are new. Um, so dementia. Um, dementia is a general term for what people experience when they are having cognitive impairment of any sort. It's a group of symptoms um, related to changes in thinking skills. So it's not necessarily a disease. I get that question a lot is what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Dementia just describes the changes, the symptoms, and the disease that causes dementia is your Alzheimer's, is your Parkinson's, is vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia. So um, just to clarify that. Um, many people, when I ask what, ask them, you know, tell me, tell me what you think dementia is, um, they will say, oh, well, memory loss, right? Um, and it's certainly much, much more than that. Um, and oftentimes that memory loss, though, is the first thing that we as family members, friends, neighbors, whatnot, notice in people that, mm, something's different. They're, they're, they're not remembering things like they used to. They're repeating themselves. Um, I've heard that story before. Oh gosh, they forgot um, this really important um, event that we had going on. Uh, but oftentimes changes happen kind of, I like to say, behind the scenes. Um, subtle changes in how a person kind of organizes their day at home or at work um, with driving, managing their finances. And a lot of those changes, I think people are able to hide, compensate for, or cope with to a point where you don't really notice those changes right away um, if, you're, if you're not living with this person that's starting to experience these changes. Um, but it becomes more obvious that when the memory, the memory impairment shows up with the excessive questions and things like that, but also shows up quite, quite um, more apparently when somebody is not able to meet their basic care needs. Um, uh, they're, they're dressing, they're unkempt, their grooming um, is poor, their hygiene is poor. Um, those things are much more noticeable that yes, there's a problem, but there can be a lot of things in the background that have changed because um, our brain does a lot for us. And that's what this, um, that's what this image summarizes here is that um, our brain, does a lot of different things. There's a lot of components to our cognition or our thinking skills. It's not just memory loss, like you see at the top of this circle. Um, our our minds help us maintain our orientation. Where are we? What time of what time of year is it? What's the date? Um, who's our president? That kind of thing. Um, it helps us to initiate and sequence um, tasks throughout our day. It helps us make wise decisions. It helps us to manage our emotions, our impulses, our frustration. Um, it, our minds also are responsible for speaking, our language skills, and all of these things that you see listed on this, um, on this image here are things that change when somebody has dementia and it's a progression. It's a, there's a, there's many, many things that change. All of these things don't, don't decline rapidly at once. It's, you'll, you'll see um, if you've uh, lived with somebody with dementia that these things happen gradually. So um, kind of as we talk through our presentation today, um, we will focus more on talking about the state, the stages of dementia being early, middle, and late here. So um, we'll kind of go to the next slide here. Um, and I just so show some visual images whenever I do a, a, a general presentation on dementia to really emphasize to people that dementia is actually a physical condition. You can see um, the changes 
uh, in this brain here. Um, the image on the left-hand side is a, a person that has passed away um, that had not developed dem a dementia. Um, the image on the right-hand side is a person that had Alzheimer's disease and passed away um, in the end stage of that disease. So you can see the, the very, very significant difference in size um, between those two brains. Um, They've, uh, the shrunken size, the, the size of the grooves between the tissues, um, because what happens when somebody has any form of dementia is um, there's brain cell tissue loss. And that's what um, the brain cells and the tissues, that's what communicates to, to allow our brain to function. So um, I always, I always like to show that, that visual because sometimes, sometimes it's hard to tell that somebody has dementia because you don't, you don't see the inner workings of their brain. You see what, see things more on the outside, which can be, can be masked for quite some time. So like I said earlier, um, as we move forward here, as I'm talking about, um, uh, approaches for cares, uh, ways to engage people in activities, and ways to manage behavior. We're going we're gonna to focus on the different stages of dementia. Um, when somebody has dementia, the course of their the course of their disease or their journey um, can span many many years. Um, on average, folks ha are living with dementia eight years, but it can be as long as 10, 15, or twenty years, depending on um, the age of onset. So um, there is a there is a long span of time where changes can occur, and often those changes happen um, gradually. So we will focus um, the rest of the the morning here on what changes from early, middle to late stage in different areas. And I will um, give you all some, some, some tips here. So we're gonna dive into the meat of the presentation and start um, talking about approaches that you can leave here today um, to help with your caregiving um, of your loved one with dementia. So um, what I'll start out with here, um, Christine, I'll have you flip to the next slide here. Um, what I'll start out with here is an analogy that I that I use often when I'm training new employees and I ask the new employees, so I'm asking you, but you're not going to be able to answer me here, but um, when you're caregiving, um, we think of it as a road trip, and on a road trip, you have a driver and a navigator, the navigator may be another person giving you directions or, you know, that GPS that you, have fun that you program on your car, um, but regardless, in a caregiving relationship, um, the person that has dementia is the driver. And we, as their caregiver, have to be their navigator. And we have to be a good navigator because without giving them the right directions and guidance through their day, it's going to be rough. Our days, their days are going to be rough. And as we say, um, using the road trip analogy, they will feel lost. They will become lost and the journey will end in, in failure. Um, and nobody wants their day to be to be like that. So um, that's that's our goal in um, caring for, for folks with dementia is to, to give them the right guidance to get through the day and really um, partner with that person um, to make it a good day. And that's that's a that's not not always easy, but I'm going to try and give you some some information here to make that easier. Um, so um, as we embark on our little journey here um, about tips and tricks, we're going to start with talking about communication techniques. When somebody has dementia, one of the noticeable changes that you'll see um, is changes in how they express themselves what they say changes, how they say things changes, and how they understand things changes. You, um, Those of you that, that have a loved one with dementia, um, work with people with dementia, you know that there's challenges that are uh, like word finding, not able to find the right words, not able to say what they need to say. Um, certainly um, things like not being able to understand us either when we're telling them something. And that can be frustrating on both ends for both the caregiver and the care. Uh, and the, the, the person with dementia. Um, biggest changes per stage that we notice um, in the early stage, there's not hugely noticeable changes in communication in the early stage. Usually if somebody is in that early stage of dementia, they're holding their own in conversation. They may be struggling with um, slight memory impairment and you know some behind the scenes stuff that they're getting help with from, um, from a family member or other person. Um, but as far as communication, they usually talk a pretty good talk. Um, 
What is impaired, usually in this middle stage, you'll notice first is their ability to understand and process information as smoothly or quickly as they once had. As a person moves from that early stage to the middle stage, they have a harder time understanding us, what we're saying to them, and also expressing themselves. So it's it's a it's a combination of what what starts in early with the understanding difficulties, and then also um, compounds with difficulty expressing themselves. So folks in the middle stage, oftentimes, you know, they they won't be able to answer your questions, um, won't be able to come up with an answer, won't be able to ask for what they need. Um, those that, that word finding difficulty, they might be more gesturing, pointing to things, saying, you know, their their talking sounds choppy, and they may say a couple words here and there that you can pick up off of and go go with and try and figure out what they're trying to say. But that's the challenge that we see arise more in the middle stages just stumbling over those words or more repetition, things like that. And then as a person does move out of that middle stage into the late stage, um, words are going to, words are going to decrease. They're going to say less. Um, and they're also going to understand a whole lot less of the words that we use. So um, oftentimes I'll recommend using less words, more gestures, um, you know, using hand gestures to have them follow you, pat a chair when you're saying sit down, um, use, use your hands to indicate standing up or um, physical cues as well can be helpful because words are words are words are much more foreign in the late stage of dementia. So um, just a just a summary of a uh, quick summary of those changes there. Um, and then another condition that's part of the dementia progression um, is a condition called apraxia. This is being recorded. Um, the, the word apraxia, it's a Latin word. Um, the root of it is, is praxis, which refers, um, to movement. And then a, uh, in Latin is usually indicating not or lack of. So difficulty with movement here. Um, and how this looks, how apraxia looks in a person with dementia, um, is that they have a harder time processing what you say. And then, um, kind of deciphering that to uh, into an action. So um, really essentially what it is is what it says on screen here. The brain does not consistently communicate to the body what it's supposed to. So if I give somebody a, a verbal direction to stand up, um, especially here in the late stages of dementia, that's where we see this apraxia arise more, more commonly. If you tell somebody in the late stage of dementia to stand up, those words don't mean a lot. Um, and it takes them a really long time to process it. It's almost as if their brain has to actually go through those steps of, okay, stand up, put my feet on the ground, use my arms to push myself up, stand tall, get my balance. Um, there's a lot of steps that go into the movements and the actions that we do throughout the day that we, I mean, and, and by we, I mean people without dementia, do automatically. Um, when people have dementia, that automatic is kind of broken as far as that brain telling the body what to do. So um, most visible in folks with dementia is the brain just sl more slowly telling the body how to move in response to a direction. Um, but we also see changes um, as the person um, declines um, further into the late to end stages of dementia, the brain also slows down that communication between the vital organs, the heart, the lungs. That's why we see breathing slowing down, heart rate slowing down and things like that. So um, that aphasia, that uh, those challenges in language skills and this apraxia are two very common terms that we'll use and, and, and things that we'll describe when somebody has dementia. So um, we'll move, we'll move on here, Christine. Um, when you are working with someone with dementia, um, you often will get pretty clear signs that they're not understanding you, obviously, clearly. Um, if a person is not understanding you, they will not 
do what you're asking or respond um, to the question or whatnot, um, they may ask you to repeat yourself or um, tell you, I don't understand. You know, that's that's obviously a clear sign that they don't understand, but they may get frustrated. They may walk away um, and get agitated um, or, you know, kind of pull themselves away from that situation by covering their eyes or ears or putting their head down just because the directions we're giving are too overwhelming. So um, what I'm going to talk to talk about next is um, just some of those those tricks that can help you um, communicate more effectively. Um, this is a big one. Um, I, I always tell people, um, folks with dementia, no matter what stage you're at, they're at, they focus more on what you do and how you approach them, and how you say things, tone of your voice, body language, then the actual words coming out of your mouth, 90% may be high, but um, I put on here 90% of what you say isn't coming out of your mouth. Um, I think we've probably all experienced that with, with people. Um, you know, you, you can tell when somebody is approaching you calmly, relaxed, they're in a good mood, um, and you, you match that often, and that's what our, that's what folks with dementia will do. You know, if you're, if you're smiling, and happy and approach calmly, um, they will often respond to your communication attempts much better. Um, incredibly important to make eye contact with folks with dementia um, to, to get their attention and know that you're talking so that they know you're talking to them. Um, when somebody does have dementia, as they move through that early to middle to late stage, their peripheral vision shrinks, their, their ability to see kind of who's around them shrinks. So we always want to approach people from the front um, to make sure they see who we are and who's talking to them. Um, we always want to get down at a person's level if they're seated and we're talking with them. Again, we want to make that eye contact. So you want to crouch down, um, get, at that, get at their level. Um, if they're seated um, on a chair, couch, toilet, that kind of thing when you're helping them. Um, no, you're going to have to repeat yourself. Um, there's a lot of a lot of patience that comes with um, providing dementia dementia care. So know that you're going to have to repeat yourself. And when you repeat yourself, you may have to change the way you're saying things. Um, if what you're saying or asking a person to do isn't uh, resonating with that person, stop. And you might need to walk away and reapproach that. Give give them an opportunity to reset, and maybe give you an opportunity to rethink how you're saying or doing things with that person. Um, always speak slowly. Um, do not argue with people um, when they say something. Don't don't if they say. Um, you know, oh, it's a, it's an awful day outside and it's snowing and, and I don't want to go out. No, no, it's actually a really beautiful day. Don't, don't, you know, don't counter, counter, counteract what they're saying. Um, just kind of go with it. Don't correct. Don't question. Don't try to, um, convince people. Um, I have caregivers, um, ask me to help with a resident who they're, they're struggling with. And they say, I just can't convince him to take a shower. And I just say, you're never going to convince someone. You've just got to change your approach. Um, um, instead of instead of asking, tell them to come with me or um, it's time, it's spa day right now and uh, it's, I'm all set for you, but um, you're not going to convince somebody to do something they don't want to do um, or reorient them. Um, you know, if somebody, if somebody is asking uh, where their mom is, um, certainly uh, answering the question with, well, well, how old, how old are you? Well, I'm 83. Well, how old would your mom be? Well, I don't know. Well, she has, she's not here. She passed away. That's not an argument you want to get into. And you don't want to reorient that person. They're, they're in a different, they're in a different time and place now because of their dementia. So um, try to avoid doing those things. Um, and again, I'm just sharing things that I have heard and seen over the years. So not saying that any of you are doing those things, but um, just things that I've I've certainly encountered. Um, and then obviously when you're communicating with somebody, always, always, always be respectful. When I greet somebody, I've oftentimes got a smile on my face. If it's across the room, I'll wave or I'll shake a hand if I'm I'm very close to them, um, just to put them at ease. So um just some just some in general uh techniques when you're communicating with with people with dementia here. Um so I could I could present I could present for probably a couple hours on different communication techniques, but um we don't have that kind of time today. So those are my those are my quick quick tips for you all. Um we're gonna dive into care delivery delivery um, 
challenges and approaches here that can be helpful working with somebody with dementia at the different stages here. Um, essentials of care delivery that I think everybody needs to, to keep in mind and hold closely is that there should always be a method to how you're approaching care with a person. You've got to uh, solidify that approach that works and do that time after time after time, because then eventually your loved one or the person that you're caring for with dementia will get used to that. It will become reliable um, and predictable for them. Your approach shouldn't vary day to day if it's not just you caring for your the person with dementia in your life. The all caregivers involved should be should be using the same approaches. Um, once you find once you find what works, stick with it. If you start to notice what had been working is no longer, then it's time to, to revamp and do some more trial and error. So um, I'm going to uh, move forward here with giving you some, some um, guidelines for what works um, usually quite well at each of the different stages here. So we'll go to the next slide here and I'll um, kind of summarize a couple other things for you. Um, like I said earlier, we as caregivers are partnering with our loved one um, with dementia, the person we're caring for with dementia, um, by, by compensating and guiding them through their care. We're compensating for losses that they have because of their dementia, because their brain cannot tell them how to do things like they used to. We're compensating for the physical skills that are that are changing. Um, we're, we're compensating for those cognitive skills, those thinking skills, those that ability to initiate their cares in the morning or put their clothes on in the right order. We're compensating for that. Our brains usually help us do those things automatically. With dementia, they don't um, do that automatically. So we need to compensate for those thinking skills that are missing and fill in those gaps. Um, and and my biggest thing that I say over and over and over again to the caregivers that I train um, is that we want people to do as much for themselves as they can for as long as they can. We don't want to do all of the work, one, because if we're doing all of the work, the person with dementia may get frustrated because they may be at a stage where I can do it myself. I don't need your help. Get away from me. Don't do that. Um, or if you're helping too much and they're cooperative with it, um, if you're helping too much, like say you you take the the you pick the brush up off the the bathroom sink and just brush their hair for them, it may seem like a small thing, but they may start to lose essential function, um, upper body function with combing their hair, um, which then, you know, we don't just use our arms for our grooming tasks. We feed ourselves. We pick things up with our hands all the time. So um, the more you do for a person too soon, the more they're going to lose. Um, I This is incredibly apparent too with things like walking. Um, you know, as people age in general, but especially with dementia, because of that apraxia, I described the brain not telling the body how to move smoothly anymore. Um, movement does slow down. People may be walking fine um, without a walker, then they then they need to start using that for a little bit more stability. And then their gait gets a lot slower. Well, let them walk as slowly as they need to because they're still walking. Um, the sooner you have somebody seated in a wheelchair, the quicker they're going to lose their muscle tone and strength to be able to participate in all sorts of other things, which is going to make um, care delivery in other areas more challenging. So um, really kind of name of the game is partner with the person and let them do as much as they can. You fill in the gaps where needed. So um, we're going to go to the next slide here and um, I'll kind of break some things down stage by stage. Um, now, in the first presentation I gave, we talked about stages, but then I got a little more specific talking about our Allen cognitive levels. I won't revert back to those Allen cognitive levels here. We'll try and keep it simple with early, middle, late stage. And if you are caring for somebody with dementia, you are probably pretty aware of what stage they're in at this point. Um, and if you're still you're still in a, in a, at a point where you're figuring that out, maybe some of what I'll say will help you. Um, uh, gauge where they're at. So um, early stage dementia, folks with early stage dementia, um, 
I just highlight some larger areas of um, care related things, communication, meals, grooming, and dressing for each of these stages that I'll talk about. So um, the, the next slides after the, the initial slide are going to have some more detail. So Folks in the early stage, I had mentioned it in the communication section, in the early stage, they usually talk a pretty good talk. They're able to still engage in conversation, simple conversation, answer questions, reminisce, things like that. So communication skills are quite intact still in the early stages of dementia. Meal times too, um, you know, a lot of times those social graces um, remain intact for quite some time, especially in the early stages. So, um, you know, if you're having, if you're preparing dinner for you and your loved one or um, the person you're caring for, serving them like you normally would, like you would serve yourself um, is usually going to be fine. They're, they're able to um, use their fork, use their knife, um, eat at an appropriate pace, drink, alternate between bites and drinks, no problems there. So meals, there aren't huge Huge problems that we usually encounter. Um, early stage folks are usually pretty capable of caring for themselves. They just are at the point where they're needing some verbal reminders to get dressed in the morning, to head on into the bathroom and finish up in there. Um, making sure, you know, maybe as the care partner, you are making sure for bathing, they're getting in and out of that shower safely and have the supplies in there they need. Just like, just like your normal home setup, you have your, you know, soap, shampoo and, and washcloth and stuff in the shower already. That's what a person in that early stage needs is kind of the basics that we pretty much already do for ourselves. So not a ton of assistance needed, um, in the early stage of dementia, just more of those, those verbal, verbal reminders and things. So nothing more specific to add to that, but progressing from the early stage to the early part of the middle stage, this is where I feel like it gets a little, little con confusing, but, um, they're moving from that early stage where they're quite independent with their personal care, still moving in the middle stage, still able to do a lot, but need a little bit more cueing from us as the care partner. Um, communication wise, still do well with verbal directions. Our verbal directions should be um, gentle. Um, if you're if you're wanting somebody to take a shower instead of you need to take a shower now, why don't you head on into the bathroom? I've got everything set up for your shower. So very subtle difference in what I've said there, but it's less of a direct direction and more of a subtle cue um, in your in your communication style as far as cares are concerned. Um, meal time still in this early part of the middle stage, um, people are are able to um, eat just fine and they're they're pretty appropriate still no no issues you might um, start seeing a person at a meal time maybe not ask for seasoning if they want more salt and pepper or a little bit of more ketchup on their their hamburger they might not ask for those things so kind of watch when you're when you're dining with somebody um, at this early part of the middle stage you know, if you know what their preferences are and you see that they haven't asked for something, maybe ask them if they would like more of whatever. Um, so those are the kind of things that we watch for at meal times. Care related more with those personal cares, grooming, dressing, and bathing. What we as care partners should be doing is setting up their supplies and letting them do what they can. Um, I'll describe that um, here in more detail in the next slide, but um, you're really setting things up for them giving them a visual cue. That's what that means. So um, things like, you know, setting up grooming would be setting out their toothbrush with their toothpaste next to it and a cup nearby. So they've got that visual cue to brush their teeth because they might be not doing all steps if all the supplies aren't out, that kind of thing. Um, the next slide, will just I will describe um, more specifics to that setup and supervision technique. Um, so I described that grooming task, setting up those supplies. Um, you're going to give them a view, verbal cue to get started. Make sure before you give that verbal cue, all those supplies that you you want them to use are set out. Um, one thing I do, especially with, with dressing, is lay items out in the order that they're to be used or put on. So for example, with dressing, this might look like when we get dressed, we have to put our underwear on before our pants. So you're going to lay out the pants and put the pair of underwear on top of those. So there's, again, that visual cue. We, use, we, we rely a lot on verbal and visual cues with our, our, our 
folks at this level. Um, and so that can be really helpful with the upper body. You know, you're going to lay the shirt out, but put the bra or undershirt um, on top of that. So again, it's that visual cue to do so. Um, and typically for folks that are kind of newly into that middle stage of dementia, they're able to do a lot for themselves with just that simple setup. Um, but we do as care partners have to come check back on them to make sure they've done everything completely. Put the lid back on the toothpaste, um, you know, make sure that you know, the zipper on their pants is pulled and that their clothes are straightened and whatnot, because they might not notice the smaller details. That's one of the things that we start noticing as somebody's moving into this middle stage here. Um, so, so that's that setup and supervision technique, um, lay things out so that they're prepared. Um, I sometimes will do that for myself on my busy days. <laughs> um, I laugh at myself that this dementia that I work with every day is contagious. It's not, but um, some of these techniques translate to everyday life for people too. Um, moving into that middle stage of dementia. So somebody in that last stage we talked about, that first part of the stage is still pretty engaged. Um still pretty aware of the steps that are the basic steps for basic things that they do every day that they've been doing their whole lives. Um, as a person moves into middle stage, starting off with the communication, um, middle stage, like I mentioned in our communication section, is where they start having a harder time understanding what we're saying um, and replying to us using the right words, finding the right words and things. So when we're communicating with somebody in the middle stage, we're going to have to, we're going to have to pare down what we say, maybe one step directions at a time, keep it simple, um, maybe provide a demonstration. Um, the middle stage of dementia, the true middle stage of dementia is where I, I start to pull out my, I start to pull out my gestures a little bit. You know, I will, um, and I tell somebody, go ahead and comb your hair. I will mimic combing my hair um, so that they have the, the verbal cue or the visual cue as well. Um, meal times, usually folks in this true middle stage still doing okay at meals. But like I said, with that last uh, last group of folks the, just into the middle stage, um, you might just want to keep an eye on them when you're dining with them. Uh, make sure that they have what they need. If they run out of something to drink, they may not ask for it. Ask if they'd like a refill, um, that kind of thing. And then jumping into the, the care-related approaches. Um, when we get into the true middle stage of dementia, you are not going to be able to lay clothing out, lay grooming supplies out, um, leave them in the shower by themselves because they will they will flounder. They will not remember which steps to do in which order. So um, you stay with that person, um, grooming, dressing, bathing, lay those supplies out and stay with them and give them one step at a time direction. Once they've put their shirt, after you've told them, here's your shirt, put that on once they've put their shirt on then you can move down to the lower body here's your underwear put those on one thing at a time and that's that's this step-by-step -step technique so um, you're going to be using that more with your person if they're in the middle stage of the dementia you stay with them you hand them items um lay items out and tell them what to do um and at this stage you are more than welcome to <laughs> kind of tell people what you what to do at the earlier part of the middle stage that explicit telling them what to do is not usually usually beneficial they get kind of upset about that because they're like I don't need you to tell me what to do um but this step-by-step -step technique is much needed once they move further into that middle stage to help um, them kind of focus on each part of the care and do things in the right order and do it well as well you know make sure that they're they're brushing their teeth for an appropriate length of time you know sometimes folks in this middle stage, you'll tell them to brush their teeth and they'll put the toothbrush in their mouth, run it over their top, run it over their bottom, and then be done. Um, you, at that point, you would want to encourage them to do a little bit more because um, they didn't do quite a thorough job. So um, just giving a little, being present to give a little bit more direction is, is kind of the name of the game here at the, at this true middle stage of dementia. So um, we will um, talk a little bit more about what the later middle stage of dementia looks like. This middle stage of dementia is the longest stage. They start out um, having a pretty good grasp on things, needing some guidance, 
needing a little bit more guidance, and then needing a lot more guidance as they get into the later part of the middle stage, because then we're verging on late stage dementia. Um, our communication, we're, we're going to stick with those one step at a time directions, keep it super short, um, and give them more time to respond to our direction um, during cares and, and whatnot. Um, at meals, um, this is this later part of the middle stages where I typically start to notice changes in folks that live with us um, at Emerald Crest. And um, you'll likely notice this if you live with your, your loved one at home too, during dining. Um, they might not initiate eating their meal when you place the plate in front of them. They might sit and look at their food and um, you will you might ask, aren't you hungry? And that person may or may not respond or take a bite. Um, they might simply need a verbal cue to, to just get started, but oftentimes they're overwhelmed by so much food. I see this with folks at meal times in this later middle stage. Um, they're just overwhelmed with so much food in front of them. Um, multiple pieces of silverware, couple drinks and things. So this is where we start simplifying meals um, for folks is usually in this late middle stage. We might just serve them one thing at a time to help them focus on on the food there um, because they're, they're, they're not able to focus on too much at this point. Their attention span is shortening. So um, that is a technique that I find that I find can be really helpful. Um, smaller portions are serving one thing at a time and then once they finish that, that food item, then give them something else to eat and offer them something else. Um, so that can be really helpful at this stage. Um, as far as, um, as far as the, the, the care tasks, um, you know, with our, with our folks in that true middle stage of dementia, we could oftentimes just tell them what to do. Now we have to hand things, um, maybe hand them their shirt in the right um, orientation and tell them one step at a time what to do. Um, so this slide just kind of summarizes a lot of what I've said with that one item at a time. It focuses their attention by handing them items um, and showing them the right way to put things on if it's dressing related or show them the right way to um, comb their hair, hold the comb, that kind of thing. Um, and it really does help guide the person through their care. So um, you're, you're at a point here, um, if the person you're caring for is in this later middle stage of dementia, that you are staying with them and you are um, helping quite a bit, giving those step-by-step -step directions um, to get them to get them where they need to be. Um, again, on this, with that road trip analogy, you know, um, Ending your ending your trip of, of daily cares with success and getting to the right location. So um, that was the end of the middle stage. Now we're moving to the late stage of dementia. As somebody gets into the late stage of dementia, you're going to start to encounter more problems because there's going to be more of a lack of understanding and recognition um, of objects of sometimes who you are too. Um, when I talk about the stages um, in our yeah, original um, dementia presentation, I talk about how this late stage can be a very challenging form or a very challenging part of of the dementia journey, because this is where, as a care partner, they may not recognize you as somebody that, that should be helping them or so, a loved one um, that should be doing the private cares with them, personal cares with them. Um, so communication, we're going to have to um, keep our directions simple and provide more hands-on assistance. One of the techniques that we'll train on um, is using hand over hand assistance, um, using using your body to help them understand how to do something um, to a, a task of sorts. Um, but communication is much simpler at this stage. Meal times we're going to continue usually in this late stage with uh, a simple setup. Usually that serving one item at a time, telling them to take a bite. Um, you may have to be sitting with this person for the duration of a meal, kind of cueing them, reminding them to keep taking bites. Um, um, that kind of thing is what you'll see at meals. Um, and then for the care um, delivery related uh, things here, um, 
as the caregiver, you're going to want to be helping them um, physically start their care um, and then allowing them to participate as much as they can because we're getting to a point now where they're needing a quite a bit more help. Um, you may think you need to do everything, but if you try to do everything, this is where you might see a little bit more resistance because um, it might feel rushed to them. It might feel scary or overwhelming to them. So um, by using this technique that we call caregiver starts individual finishes, what that looks like, how you can practice that um, is if you're getting some helping somebody get dressed, help them get their arms into the sleeves of the shirt and then let them pull it over. So you're doing the start instead of handing them their shirt and saying, put this on, you're getting it started. Let's put your shirt on, get it started on their arms and usually the wheels will start turning in their mind and they will then understand, oh, I have to pull it over the rest of my head. So um, by you starting, it gives them time to kind of understand and, and let it click what you're trying to do for them, what, how you're trying to help them, helps them, you know, remember how to use things. Um, and it keeps them functional um, and, and promotes that cooperation. Because again, if you're, you're trying to do all the work, they may resist that because it can be overwhelming or scary. So um, kind of partner with and use that uh, uh, um, caregiver start resident finishes um, approach. Um, another approach that I often will use with people at the late stage, again, because of that that fear factor, that not understanding um, what you're trying to do to them or for them. Um, care can be really overwhelming for people is the approach that we call start at the feet and work your way up. So um, say you're, you're helping your loved one get into the shower, take a shower you're not going to want to start with rinsing their hair because that can feel very startling and uncomfortable to have that water on a person's head, water flowing down in front of your eyes. You're obscuring one of those really important senses that they rely on, especially in this late stage um, of dementia. So showering is my, my main example for starting at the feet and the working up. We're going to want to start, 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 trickling that water on their feet, getting them used to the idea that we're using water, that we are washing up, um, give them a chance to get comfortable with the temperature of that water um, and work your way up to the rest of the body. Those feet, um, we always say starting at the feet and working your way up works because starting down by your feet is a whole lot less intrusive than um, starting up with washing the hair or if you're helping somebody get undressed and ready for bed, instead of pulling that shirt over their head, you know, just right away taking their shirt off, um, maybe start down at their feet, help them sit, have them sit down, help them, you know, take their shoes off and then take one shoe off and then do that slowly and then take the socks off and then you can work your way up because it's a little, little more comfortable for them and, and also then gives them that extra time to understand what you're doing um, when you're trying to trying to assist them. You're not trying to harm them or, or, or rip their clothing off, but that is sometimes what people will perceive that task as when you're when you're doing those more personal cares in this this later stage of dementia. Um, I will wrap up our care delivery section here talking about um, what to expect at the end stage of dementia. So we're doing a lot. We're st we have been stepping in quite a bit to stay with the person, physically help them more with their cares at that late stage of dementia. As somebody moves from the late to the end stage of dementia, they're going to need a whole lot more help. And this is where I start telling caregivers that, you know, I've said, over the course of the, the years and the stages that we've gone through, let them do as much as they can. By the end stage, people are not really participating much at all. Communication-wise, um, you're going to want to be just gently, calmly talking to the person, telling them what you're going to do before you do it. Um, uh, alert them when you're you know, working in a certain body area. I always use very gentle touch cues, like if I'm down working at their feet or if I work my way up to their um, legs with like washing, I will kind of tap their, their upper leg before I get it wet, that kind of thing. So you're using a lot more um, just gentle touch cues and kind of telling them what you're doing before you do it with, your, with their cares. Um, um, at meal times, um, 
late moving to the end stage of dementia, if they're still, you know, swallowing appropriately and interested in eating, you know, a lot of times as we move into this end stage, the interest in food changes and they're not as interested, but you might be seeing more residents, uh, more people needing to use their fingers to eat because they don't remember how to use utensils. Um, one tip I tell people is a lot of times folks with their utensil get away with using a spoon the longest because that is the first utensil we learn how to use. It's the last one that we forget how to use. So maybe using a spoon, but by this late to end stage of dementia, um, likely not even recognizing what a utensil is anymore, but still able to maybe feed themselves by picking up the banana, picking up a piece of toast, picking up a, a, a broccoli spear um, and feeding that to themselves and or getting to the point, especially as we get into that end stage, feeding that person and um, slowly doing so, offering bites, um, bringing it up to their mouth um, with the, you know, you using the utensil, uh, glass of glass of their drink, bringing that up gently to their mouth and making sure that they um, respond to that when you do so. Um, care wise, we are doing all of the cares at this point for folks at this end stage of dementia. We are providing the care, caregiver completes the care. Um, a lot of times what I like to do uh, while I'm, while I'm doing the work is I, if, if they can, if they're, if they're alert enough, um, I will give them maybe a washcloth to hold on to while I'm washing the rest of their body. Or, um, if I'm helping them get dressed, I might give them a sock to hold on to in one hand while I'm doing some other work. Um, uh, putting their socks and pants on or something like that. Um, why do we, why do we at this late stage have to complete the care for that person? It is because they've lost the understanding of the process of that care in general. Um, objects mean very little to them. They don't recognize things as much anymore. Um, they may be able to reflexively grasp or hold on to things. Um, but um, not not recognize objects for what they are. You might see more of in this late stage people putting um, items in their mouth that they shouldn't be. Um, so be be aware of that. Um, that can be something that occurs here in this late stage. Um, but folks at this end late to end stage do not um, follow those verbal directions. But I still I still encourage caregivers to continue talking to the person you're caring for, talking calmly, gently, telling them what you're you're doing. Sometimes I have, I talk more to my folks that are in the late to end stage of dementia when I'm providing total care than I do to my other residents, because I just want them to feel a comforting presence. So I'll share stories. I'll talk about the weather, the holidays that are coming up and that kind of thing. So um, please do talk and provide comfort when you're providing care um, for, for a person at this late stage. Um, and just know that you're going to be doing all of the work. Um, and know that your loved one's going to have trouble, trouble with all, all parts of it and even coordinating movements and things like that. So you might have to um, do a little bit more physical, physical maneuvering and manipulation of their body too. And there's some, there's some um, additional, additional techniques and, and tricks that I, that I um, tell people that we can use. Um, Christine, I'll have you flip to the next slide. Um, We'll um, get into the rest of our tips and tr tricks and tips and tricks of the trade um, here in just a minute. But um, I don't know if I talked about that in another slide or another presentation, but we do often at this late stage, sorry, I shouldn't have skipped to this next slide already, um, adaptive clothing. Um, sometimes people in that late stage because they're not moving as well. Um, oh, there it is. All right. Well, skipping ahead. Um when somebody is having a harder time um, physically in that late stage, I'll start out at the bottom with our bullet points here. Um, we might want to use adaptive clothing, which just means, and you can see some some images um, to the right there of of some some examples of adaptive clothing, clothing that goes on and comes off easier. If you, as the caregiver, are doing more of the work and the person is less engaged and also less comfortable with physically participating in cares, you might want clothes that come on and go off a lot easier. Um, and they're not going to have to move their arms and limbs and stand up as long for those things. So they, there's adaptive shirts that go on on the arms and snap around the back. There's a little strap of snaps down the back. Um, that can make it a lot easier for people that can't 
any longer raise their arms up above their head to pull a shirt off over their head. It just comes comes on and off over their arms. Um, looser clothing, if you don't want to go the route of purchasing adaptive clothing, just looser clothing that can be easy to pull on and off um, can be really helpful. Um, other, other dressing tips, these other ones are um, in the middle here, um, are things that I recommend for people that are more in that early part of the middle, middle stage of dementia. Um, a lot of times what I'll see with folks is they don't think they need to change their clothes because I just put this on or I like this outfit. I would like to keep wearing this. So sometimes I'll recommend to families that third bullet point there um, have multiples of the same outfit. We've had residents that they just, they like wearing one thing. Um, I remember when I was a kid, my sister was the same way. Um, so my mom had the same pair of purple shorts and striped shirt that she would wear every day of the week. Um, same go went for a couple of my residents that I've, that I've cared for and kind of rec made that recommendation to family. Sometimes multiples of the same outfit can help if they don't want to change out of that, but you can get them to change if it's the same thing. Um, other, another trick um, of the trade with dressing um, is to eliminate unnecessary steps. Um, sometimes those of you know, um, folks, you know, they, their attention span shorter and they just want nothing to do with you helping them get dressed or undressed. So the less uh, layers maybe they have on, the easier it is to get, get, get on and get them off. So um, I might recommend not using an undershirt, a bra, or, you know, having somebody put on a long sleeve shirt, putting a, 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 a sweater over that, and then a, then another jacket over that. Um, buy warmer clothing if, if they're layering clothes because they're cold. Um, but try to try to eliminate unnecessary steps, um, having so many layers of clothes that have to go on and come off um, in that dressing realm. So those are some of my tricks of the trade there. Um, Mealtime tricks of the trade here. Um, during mealtimes, like I talked about, as we kind of progress through those levels, um, what you probably noticed was we simplified our setup throughout, you know, they could, they could do well with the normal setup, then we had to supervise a little bit more, then we might have to give them smaller portions, um, serve one item at a time, um, simplify, if, if you notice a person not eating or not eating kind of at a, at a normal rate, there's ways to simplify, serve smaller portions, serve one item at a time, um, I have listed on there, sweeten it up, um, when somebody has dementia, and I think this is as we age as well, um, to some degree, our taste buds change um, and they become less sensitive. The taste buds that taste sweet are the ones that are preserved the longest. So a lot of times if somebody isn't eating, maybe more of those savory meals, sweeten it up a little or serve something sweet or instead, you know, I've got a resident right now, he is in the late stage of dementia, and he, you know, he, he has a, he's on a softer diet, and he'd always eaten like scrambled eggs and, and toast and butter and things, and he just doesn't, didn't seem interested in that. Well, we, we, we changed from scrambled eggs to an oatmeal with some brown sugar, gobbled that up. And then instead of just buttered toast, we started putting jelly on his toast. And um, that seemed to make all the difference. And even if he doesn't eat his um, larger meal at lunch or dinner, he's eating the dessert. So um, that's just kind of that later stage um, preference. So if there's a way to sweeten up um, kind of those main meals, um, even using a, a smoothie, a fruit smoothie or a shake of some sort of protein shake, you know, those are, that's a good way to get nutrients in, especially if somebody's not quite eating some of those um, more healthier savory foods. So sweeten it up can be really helpful. Finger foods can also be helpful um, at meal times too to um, simplify that for them as they move from that uh, middle middle to the later stage of their dementia. So um, we have to as we have to as caregivers kind of let go of the idea of what's normal. Um, and, and allow that person, um, kind of the dignity to do what they can 
however they can. So the finger foods can be hard for people, you know, if they're, if you're especially like out to eat still or around other people that you don't usually dine with, you know, it can feel embarrassing, but it's not. Um, it, it actually is, is good for that person to still be engaged in that meal. So tricks of the trade here um, that I oftentimes will pass along um, regarding bathing. Um, bathing um, is one of the more challenging care care tasks across the board here, no matter what stage a person is at. So um, things that I consider um, before I before I do cares with a resident, before I do a shower with a new person, um, I always make sure I find out, um, and, and you would know this if you're caring for your loved one in home still, um, what time of day they preferred to shower or take a bath, or if they prefer to shower or take a bath. Some people um, that I've that I've worked with had never taken a shower before. So our 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 attempts at showering twice a week uh, were not met with a with a very happy happy response um, because they'd never never showered before. Why am I standing up to bathe? I usually am in the bathtub or whatnot. So uh, preferences, asking those preferences are really important. Um, sticking with the time of day that was normal for them. Um, bathing in a bathtub, standing up in a shower, sitting down in a shower. Um, those are all things to consider. I always teach and train um, that you try to avoid the S word, um, uh, which is shower. Um, it's time for your shower. Try to avoid saying that. Um, instead of it's time for your shower, say, come with me end up in the bathroom where you've got all your supplies set up and I kind of listed listed some other things crank up the heat in the bathroom you know make it comfortable for that person sometimes I'll tell I'll try with residents and I'll, this is the approach we'll use we'll make it more like a spa day instead of hopping right in the shower getting them on the shower chair and starting that shower I'll start with soaking their feet so they get used to the idea of being wet and feeling that warm water and kind of relax a little bit um one of the other things I like to do, um, I said crank up the heat in the bathroom. Yeah, it's not listed on here, but I will warm up towels in the dryer for a little while before I give a shower, fold them up, and they usually retain their heat quite well um, to the end of the shower. And then you have, at, at least at the end of the shower, something that's really warm and comfortable for that person. Um, so yeah, I mean, considering a person's comfort once you get them in there by not telling them they're having a shower, by saying, come with me, um, considering their comfort and doing the things to help um, keep them comfortable are my biggest tricks of the trade here with bathing. So um, so yeah, um, and, and bathing, bathing is one of those things that sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and you just kind of have to set new goals for yourself. Well, we didn't get two this week, but maybe, maybe we can get one. Um, grooming tricks of the trade. Um, what I find, um, and you will see when folks move through the stages of their dementia, they aren't recognizing objects as well. And so most people's bathroom countertops are, are very similar in that we have we have a lot of our supplies just kind of laying around and we just pick them up and use them when we need to. And um, toothbrushes in the toothbrush holder, um, toothpaste off to the side, and we just kind of gather what we need to when we need it. Well, that can be really overwhelming to somebody with dementia. They may not recognize items for what they are. They might see the toothpaste, grab that, brush their teeth, but forget to put the toothpaste on because it's not right next to the toothbrush. So um, we keep um, one, one of the tricks that we use at, at uh, Emerald's Crest with our residents and our caregivers do this is um, we keep all the residents grooming supplies in a box and we will bring that into their room to do cares with them, um, set their supplies out, help them use them however they need to be helped, and then pack that box up and bring it out of the room because then we're not having supplies in the room that, you know, they may misuse too. You know, I talk talked about them not knowing what to use and when, but they may also misuse things. Um, you know, a lot of times I know on my bathroom sink, I have a cup, I have soap, I have a bottle of lotion. Um, when fo folks don't recognize things because of their dementia, they might see a bottle of liquid soap and a cup next to it and pour themselves a glass of soap to drink. Um, again, just confusing items for what they are. Um, had a resident one time I went to see him and he was already out of bed when he, when I got there and he was in the bathroom and he said, come on in. And he said, I'm just shaving. And he had, uh, he had toothpaste 
on his face instead of shaving cream. So grabbed the wrong tube and was kind of a sticky mess. So we had to start, had to start over there. So again, grooming boxes, I indicate that, or um, just kind of keeping things put away tidy in a drawer or whatnot, um, and only bringing out what you need the person to use when they need to use it. Um, I have listed there remove mirrors. That is um, something that we occasionally will do when somebody moves into that mi um, more of the, the later stages of dementia and maybe end middle um, or late stage of dementia, people stop recognizing themselves in the mirror. So they may um, go into the bathroom and be startled. They think that the person in the mirror is a person in the bathroom with them. Or they may become upset because they don't believe that's who they are. So sometimes I'll say remove the mirror from the bathroom. Um, not something that we need to do with most people, but it can be helpful if you kind of encounter that with your loved one. Um, and then just with everything, simplify those steps, you know. Um, Maybe somebody had a really extensive uh, facial care routine as far as makeup removal, serum, moisturizer, then uh, face mask. Like, you're gonna want to probably eliminate some of the steps of of those of those routines instead of maybe a a shampoo and conditioner in the shower, um, having just a, a two in one kind of thing. So that's what I mean by simplifying steps for your grooming and hygiene. So um, we'll move on to our next tips, tricks, and tricks of the trade um, related to incontinence. Um, as people move through the course of their dementia, they are not always remembering to get themselves to the bathroom, not always asking to go to the bathroom, or going to the bathroom in inappropriate places where they shouldn't, um, because they can't remember where the bathroom is, but they know they have to go. So, um, Tips of the trade kind of related to that, you know, somebody going to the bathroom in the wrong place, make sure you have signs on your bathroom door. Sometimes that can simply help, you know, if somebody's walking around the house looking for the bathroom, if there's a sign and they can still read or maybe put a picture um, of a toilet on there, that can be helpful for some people. Um, I know with a lot of our male residents, um, they are preferring still to stand up versus sit down. Obviously, sitting down might be a little bit cleaner, um, but still preferring to stand up to urinate. Um, but they miss they aim wrong. Um, sometimes a colored toilet seat can be helpful for them in kind of aiming where they're supposed to. Um, raised toilet seats, those can be helpful for people that physically are having a harder time getting up and off of the toilet. Um, sitting down, maybe they need those side rails to help um, reach for and guide them down. Um, kind of going back to the um, mainly gentlemen, um, hiding the trash can. Uh, this was a big, a big, a big issue for my grandma when she was caring for my grandfather at home. Um, he would always not use the toilet, but he'd pee in the, uh, in the wastebasket. Well, it was right next to the toilet. And so, um, instead of her continuing to yell at him to not pee in the trash can, I said, grandma, why don't you just move the trash can to the other side of the bathroom? And she said, oh my gosh, that really helped. So, um, that can be really helpful. Um, just relocating that trash can, um, to a different place. If there, that happens to be an issue of them going to the bathroom in the, in the garbage can. Um, and then really to avoid, you know, a person trying, to figure out what to do on their own, maybe have a toileting schedule. Maybe it's something you say, you know, um, hon, why don't you go use the, use the bathroom before, before we eat, um, and kind of get them into that routine of using the bathroom maybe before or after meals. Um, just, you know, make a schedule for yourself and them to kind of keep them, keep them, uh, attuned to going at certain times of the day versus having to just, oh my gosh, I have to go to the bathroom. Um, Toileting schedules can be really helpful. Um, and then lastly, I have listed on um, my tricks of the trade for incontinence is a jumpsuit. Um, sometimes we have we have folks that they um, consistently urinate in inappropriate places, uh, defecate in inappropriate places, and we have tried all of our other interventions that we that we know of, and they're still they're still removing clothing, going to the bathroom in, you know, places that they shouldn't be. Um, and so there's a, a piece of adaptive clothing um, called a jumpsuit that um, is a, a, a shirt and a pair of pants that are essentially sewn together and they zip, um, they zip up the back. So the person cannot 
pull them down um, unless they're assisted by their their care partner. Um, again, you know, some people have have issue with that, and that's our kind of our last resort is that jumpsuit because it it can be perceived as a as a restraint for that person. But if you're if you're closely monitoring your care, their care, and you're helping them when they need to be helped, then um, it's a pretty a pretty safe gentle route to go. But um, like I said, it is our, it is usually um, with this incontinence piece are the last trick of the trade that we use because we want to try other interventions as far as that, that, uh, that toileting schedule, those different approaches and, and things like that using different bathrooms and whatnot. So, um, so yeah, that's our tricks of the trade there with uh, incontinence. Um, what I recommend um, medication wise, this can be a big struggle um, getting somebody with dementia to take their medications because they don't believe that they they are taking any medications, that they need any medications, or they're paranoid, suspicious. We oftentimes see this more in the um, early part of the middle stage. They think they're that you're trying to give them something harmful or that you're trying to poison them. So um, sometimes we'll pull out phrases like, these are your vitamins, or these are prescribed from your doctor. Um, Sometimes we've had families that have had to call every time we need to pass meds, mom, take your medications, it's okay. Um, kind of in our in our type of setting. So um, there's some of those phrases that you can kind of pull out to maybe help them be less suspicious. Um, otherwise, um, sometimes we have to go the route of, of uh, concealing their their meds, um, either crushing those and putting them into their food or um, seeing if there's a liquid alternative to a person's medication, especially especially those more crucial medications um, and things like that. We're going to, we want to find a way to get those into people um, safely. Um, if you're going to um, put it in a person's food or a drink, you know, make sure that they are finishing um, what they've you've offered them to eat or drink that has the medication in it, uh, make sure nobody else um, inadvertently picks up that cup of juice in your family or anything like that. So um, some medication related tricks there. Um, there's probably probably plenty more that if we uh, had one of our nurses on this presentation, they could ask add to, but those are the more common ones that we'll use here. So um, we'll uh, We'll move on and kind of wrap up this care delivery section with a couple more tips about safety. You know, if your loved one is still living in your own home with you, um, that home may still be familiar with them, but it, to them, but it may also, you know, start becoming unfamiliar where um, they're getting lost or some of the stuff that you have out um, becomes more of a, a hazard than not. Um, so I always tell families, be mindful of how much stuff you have in the house, stuff can be overwhelming to somebody with dementia. Too many things can um, cause them to become pretty anxious, um, I've seen. So you might want to minimize the amount of furniture. Um, Safety-wise, eliminate rugs and floor mats that they could potentially trip on, or if they're using a walker now, those things can catch on that, and that can put them at a pretty a pretty high risk for falls. Um, assistive devices, again, you know, if that person was walking around the house fine before, they may, they may be needed needing a little more support as far as like a cane or a walker or something like that. Um, and then um, not ideal, but you know, if, if your loved one is in a separate room from you part of the day um, and you're worried about them standing up and falling, um, it may be helpful to use um, an alarm. There's, you know, a lot of a lot of different options for like motion sensor alarms that can alert you when they're when they're up or whatnot. Um, related sort of to that would be elopement you can uh, you you may you may have been there with your loved one that they may try to leave the house um unaccompanied and not know where they're going and maybe leave at not good times of the day, middle of the night, or um, you might not know they leave. So, um, you know, helpful to, like I said, with falls that those motion sensor alarms can be helpful to know that somebody is up and moving and that you need to be there, but you can also use a motion sensor type alarm, uh, maybe by your front door or your back door um, to kind of alert you if somebody, if, if your loved one is near that, um, sometimes putting bells on the door, you know, those will jingle when the door opens opens and closes. That's a non-technological intervention there. Um, sometimes, sometimes stop signs or do not enter signs 
would be enough to keep somebody from opening or closing a door. Um, oftentimes not, but I always say, you know, try it, go through this list of things to try. Um, one of the tricks that, um, that I use, that we use, is the lights. Um, oftentimes what we'll see is that people with dementia will not enter a room if the lights are off. So if you don't want them entering a certain room, keep those lights off. Turn the lights on if that's an okay place for them to be. So that can be that can be helpful in 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 some in some instances. Um, and then as far as um, another you know kind of activity that folks do in in the more middle to late stages of dementia is that wandering. They they're wandering around the house. They're they're just walking. They're walking to walk. They're walking to keep busy. Um, you know, to eliminate that, um, we'll talk more in the next section about different activities you can engage people with, keep them busy. Maybe just walk with them. Take a take a longer walk to um, kind of get some of that energy out to kind of to slow some of that wandering, the frequency of the actual wandering. Maybe maybe we can get some of that energy out by actually having them walk at a at a designated time with you or somebody else. Um, that can be that can be helpful too. So um, I know safety is safety is a huge concern of of those of you that are still caring for a loved one at home. So um, just some just some tips there. Um, certainly not everything I could recommend, but um, we'll try and keep it to a minimum here. Um, but ultimately to wrap up this care delivery section, um, caring for a person with dementia is no easy task. Um, and so hopefully some of those tricks and that progression of simplifying things helps, but ultimately as a caregiver for somebody with dementia, know that you are there to kind of fill in those gaps that are, that are becoming more and more apparent as they progress. Um, what you do is not easy. It is not easy to be a caregiver and it takes time to find those techniques and approaches that work. Um, it is a skill. Um, it is a skill you will need to develop. And um, I don't think many of us are prepared to be developing that skill. So, um, you know, have, have confidence in yourself, um, practice, 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 practice different approaches. And once you've nailed it, keep that up. Um, uh, consistency is definitely key. Um, how you're helping somebody, um, you have to be a little bit more subtle about that in the more early, early part of the middle stage. Um, that's why we list not make it not make it not so obvious to the individual. Um, sometimes people don't want to be helped. A lot of times I'll, I'll remind caregivers, you know, try to avoid telling somebody, especially in the earlier stages. I'm here to help you because they don't believe they need help. So try to avoid the word help and, and just say instead, I just came to see how you're doing. I just came to be here with you, keep you company, and then kind of gradually move into the care you need. Um, and just just uh, caregiving is, is, a, is a thankless job, but uh, you're doing an amazing job. Stay calm, stay consistent, stay open, stay creative. Maybe try some of these things that we talked about um, today. Um, certainly, um, Christine can pass along my contact information if you want to chat more about specifics. Um, I'm more than happy to help problem solve. Um, but ultimately, you know, you, you all are probably, probably aces at trial and error um, and know that it, this 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 journey with dementia care caregiving takes takes a lot of time patience and um, trial and error and simplification. Um, I, I I will say that making things simpler is the name of the game in caring for somebody with dementia. Um, it, we're not all we're not all trained in breaking down tasks into smaller steps, but um, that's definitely a skill you learn to learn to hone when you are when you're caring for somebody with dementia. So um, we'll end our end our care care delivery section and focus more on some of these activities that you um, can do with your loved one. Um, you know, care is a big part of what we need to do um, with our loved one that's still living with us. Um, if they're still living in, in your home with you um, and it's just you and um, you need to you need to you need to figure out how to keep them active and engaged because care, toileting, meal times, um, rest times, that only takes up part of your day. Um, I, I always say that life is more than that. 
Um, you know, uh, people when they develop dementia, nobody's prepared for it. Um, nobody intends to um, need help with these things. Nobody intends to have to give up the things that they've always loved and enjoyed. So activity is a really important thing to um, keep alive for the person with dementia. Um, there's hobbies that we all have, um, interests that we all have, things that we enjoy doing that um, despite dementia, there's ways to modify things so that people can still engage. So that's what I'm going to kind of quickly go through. I don't want to make this a two hour long presentation. So um, quickly go through some suggestions for how to how to engage people in activity um, at the different stages of dementia. Um, your day um, should have some structure and routine to it for your loved one with dementia, getting out of bed at the same time, um, taking a shower in the morning, getting dressed, going down for breakfast, whatever your routine may be, have a routine. Um, routine and structure is highly important for the person with dementia and it'll make your day easier. Um, and, and then incorporate activity throughout the day. We have to find a balance between um, the activity and the physical things that we're having a person do and rest. Um, people with dementia get, get, tired more quickly, gets overstimulated more quickly. And so we have to be mindful of that when we're um, uh, kind of creating this routine and structure for somebody to make sure it's not too busy, but busy enough. Um, so be mindful of that. Um, and then be also very mindful of purposeful activity versus passive activity or noise in quotes there. I don't have it in quotes, but meant to. Um, have something that the resident or the resident, the person um, wants to be doing, um, has an interest in um, versus a passive activity, um, sitting in front of a, a television program um, uh, that they're not paying attention to. So um, I'm a big proponent of active activities versus sitting in front of a television or um, just looking at a, a picture, a picture or things like that. Some of, sometimes those things can be um, you know, engaging if you're with that person and you're engaging them, but try to try to find more purposeful activities. Um, and also the activities that we plan for our, our loved ones with dementia have to be more geared towards what they understand and can do at their at their level of dementia versus what we enjoy. It's more about them and less about us. Um, I always tell that to my caregivers because we ask them to do the activities with the with our residents with dementia and um you know it might be oh gosh we I just we we do this all the time well it's not for you it's for the residents and the residents actually actually really enjoy that activity so kind of be mindful of those things when you're when you're planning activities for your loved one um but what I'm going to go through next here um uh, not next. Um, <laughs> what I'm going to go through now um, is what that routine and structure provides for your loved one by making a schedule um, to keep for you and your loved one. Um, that's going to help them feel much more relaxed and relieved. They're going to feel like they have much more control. There's not going to be that wandering, that asking, what do I do now? Where do I go? Um, it's actually going to help both you and your loved one um, if you have that routine and structure in place because then there's going to be no question about what's going on and no um, kind of that uncomfortable feeling of ugh, anxiety where do I go what do I do so we want our we want our our folks with dementia to feel that sense of relief and feel like okay I'm okay I'm in good hands you know that kind of thing so um Real quickly, I'm just going to go through each of the stages of dementia and kind of describe what might be helpful, what type of activities might be helpful for them. Folks in the early stage of dementia, um, these are your folks that are oftentimes, they look okay. We talked about communication-wise, they hold their own in conversation. Care-wise, they can still do a lot for themselves. Activity-wise, they still are quite able to participate in a lot of the things that they used to. Um, I would say if one of their, their hobbies is, um, you know, fixing cars or woodworking or something quite technical, they might not be able to do that anymore. But certainly things like um, if they're, if they're readers, if they were part of a book club, they can still do that. They can still engage in conversation about things like that. Um, they're just not able to maybe learn new things. So maybe if they like to take classes where they were um, learning something new, that might be harder for them. Um, but 
well-loved activities can usually um, persist here in the, the early stage of dementia. Um, we might have to simplify some of those activities, break it down into fewer steps um, than they used to be doing. Um, but I always say folks in the early stage can still be active, active participants in stuff around the house um, that they always used to help in, or maybe, maybe you now have them helping with the laundry and they never used to do that, but they still can. Um, I think people um, with early stage dementia still want to be active. So kind of engage in what they, what they love and simplify as needed. So um, per, uh, preferred hobbies, um, kind of keep those going in that um, early stage of dementia. As they move into the middle stage of dementia, um, they're going to have a little bit more, less focus on the activities that they're doing, um, they're going to um, maybe be less conversational. So maybe if some of the activities they used to enjoy their hobbies, if they used to like going out for coffee or being a part of a, a book club or um, a Bible study group, um, that might be harder for them to focus on. So you might have to take a step back and maybe um, find a different way to engage um, in things like that. Um, we're going to want to incorporate st uh, tasks with fewer steps. Um, you know, I, I always, I always go to those household tasks, you know, sorting, sorting, um, laundry, sorting silverware, putting things away in the, from the dishwasher. Um, again, those things are things that they can still probably help with. Um, give them a task that they can start and finish. Um, otherwise they're going to be like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Um, a lot of times our early middle stage folks are, are, are they're big helpers. Um, they like to help us with anything we need to get done, putting stuff away um, around the house. Um, you know, maybe you're, you're sending out holiday cards. It's that, that time of year's coming up, have them put the things in the envelope and put the return address sticker and the stamp on, you know, three, four steps there. Um, that can be something that's, you know, meaningful because you're doing your, your, your annual Christmas cards together and things like that. So, um, those kind of things in early middle stage, you know, giving them some more simple tasks. So simplifying, simplifying everyday type activities, um, in that early middle stage is good. Um, kind of moving into the, um, middle stage or later middle stage here. We'll look at the next slide, Christine. Um, we're going to want to incorporate more familiar tasks, um, fewer steps. Um, I do a lot of um, kind of guided laundry folding instead of having a full basket of different kinds of clothes with your, you know, shirts, pants, underwear, uh, linens, and things like that. Maybe just give them sort out and give them the washcloths to fold or sort out and give them just the socks to pair up. Um, because if it's the full basket of laundry, that might be too overwhelming to a person. Um, but yeah, simple sorting tasks like that can be helpful. They might need some step-by-step -step directions. You might need to stay with them if it's not that simple of a task. Um, we've got a picture there of, a, of shoe shining it. That's just kind of a, um, a simple, repetitive, straightforward task. So um, that's kind of a silly one. But I, I oftentimes say simplify your household tasks, you know, do things together um that you that you used to do together um moving into the late stage of dementia um we're focusing on a lot less steps here once a person moves to the late stage of dementia their abilities are less on um active tasks and more on just repetition um so we do you know rolling balls of yarn sanding wood um full, you know, just piling things up. Like I've got some different types of cloth that I'll say, can you, can you sort these into a pile? And they, you know, the residents will flatten them out for me and get them in a nice little pile. Um, it's just, it's more um, sensory based. That's kind of what we're moving into as we move into the late um, end stages of dementia is wanting to use more um, sensory based tasks. Um, um, and that's especially, especially true as they get towards that end stage, you know, on this slide here, um, folks are more, more focused on their senses, what they can hear, what they feel, what they can um, engage in with their senses. So we'll use aromatherapy. Um, on the bottom left of this slide, there's a little, it's called a twiddle muff. Um, it's a little, it's a little, um, 
fabric uh, fabric thing with different things sewn on it, different textures, different clasps. Because um, again, people at this late stage of dementia, they kind of just like to fiddle and, and randomly interact with objects. Um, in the middle there, we've got a picture of an essential oil. We use a lot of smell to kind of induce calm um, or alertness. Um, peppermint oil and citrus oils can be alerting. Um, familiar smells, like if you're baking in the kitchen, um, Again, that's an activity you could have a person maybe present for at that late stage. They're maybe not helping as much with the, the mixing of the recipes or, or whatnot, but um, they can be around for that fragrance and whatnot. Um, another thing that works really, really well um, for folks in the late to end stages of their dementia is things that um, bring them comfort and joy, such as babies and animals. Um, if you are lucky enough to have a, a grandchild or a great grandchild that visits, um, oftentimes you'll probably know that um, your loved one with dementia lights up. Um, we see that with our residents. So um, if you don't have grandkids or kids that visit and a baby is something that that brings them joy, there's a lot of dolls out there now that you can get that look very realistic. Um, and to the person in this stage of their dementia, it is real to them. Um, pets, of course, if you have a pet at home, usually that goes over quite well. Um, but if not, there's um, you can certainly get a, a stuffed animal. Sometimes that can be calming and comforting to a person. So um, those kind of things can be can be really can be really helpful um, at this late to end stage of dementia. Um, and I don't know where we're, we're at. We're at an hour and a half, everybody. And I usually um, kind of tack on a little bit of information about, about behaviors. I'll be real quick about this to kind of wrap up here. Um, managing behaviors. When you are, are living or caring for and or caring for a person with dementia, you know that they, they act differently. They behave differently. Um, and what we look at look at when we um, see a resident having a behavior. So behavior just means they're doing something out of the ordinary. Behaviors are a mode of communication. So Christine, I'll have you flip to the next slide and we'll just um, go through these, these real quickly here. Um, when people are doing things that are unexpected, so say your loved one is wandering or pacing around the house, your loved one is rummaging through things. Your loved one is trying to get out the door. Um, they're banging on the table. They're trying to take their clothes off. They're trying to tell you something. A behavior is a method of communication of a need that is not being met. The resident is not trying to frustrate you, annoy you, upset you, harm you when they're having a behavior. They're trying to tell you something. And so that's kind of our basis for behavior. When a resident's having a behavior, those are the things that you need to think about. What is my loved one trying to tell me? And um, on the next slide here, there's, there's several different areas of need that they might be trying to tell you something related to a need. Is it a medical need? And I won't read through this whole list, but is it something they're feeling that they need and they can't tell you? Because they have dementia, because their ability to communicate is impaired, they may be doing certain things or actions to get your attention and indicate that they're hungry or thirsty or have to go to the bathroom. Or maybe they're diabetic and their blood sugar is too high or too low. And that might be why they're acting unusually because they don't feel good. Um, are they too hot? Are they too cold? Um, again, I see residents occasionally that will start taking their clothes off um, in the dining room. And I'll have caregivers say, oh my gosh, they're stripping their clothes off. They're being so inappropriate right now. Are they, or are they trying to tell you that my shirt is too tight or I'm really hot? Um, just encountered that with a resident a couple of weeks ago and it made all the difference. Brought her back to her room, helped her change into a t-shirt. She's fine. She's just too hot in the sweater that we had her dressed in. Um, are they trying to tell you they need something um, changed about the environment in that bottom right-hand corner? Is it an environmental problem? Is there is the house too noisy? Um, 
Do you have the TV and the radio on and you're vacuuming at the same time? Sometimes that can be enough to overwhelm a person and cause cause behaviors. So again, I'm not going to read through all of these lists, but consider, is it something they're feeling? Is it something in the environment? Is it something personal? Sometimes, sometimes behaviors happen because they're just at a particular stage of dementia and we have to figure out in an intervention to keep them busy, um, to keep them from wandering or rummaging. Um, if they're in that late stage, they're probably urinating in inappropriate places. Start using that toileting schedule. Sometimes past memories can cause a person to have behaviors and those are the hardest kind of behaviors to redirect because while folks with dementia forget a lot, they don't always forget those bad things. So we try um, with these types of behaviors to just provide comfort um, and then just kind of redirect their attention to something else. And then finally, what we have to think about what is the resident trying to tell us? Are they trying to tell us that we're not approaching them the right way? If somebody is verbally or physically resistant to your assistance with cares, are you using the right approach? Are you helping them the right way? Maybe you have to back up to what we talked about in the care delivery section. Maybe you have to simplify your approach. Maybe you have to avoid using certain words or find a new phrase to get them to understand. Um, is it your approach as far as your body language, your mood? Um, I know that especially caring for somebody in, in your own home and it's just you, it can get really overwhelming. Unfortunately, if you let that overwhelming and that sadness or that anger or that frustration show, your loved one's going to pick up on it and that might cause them to react um, in, a, in a, 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 a not a good way to you and have a be have those those behaviors, those things that um, you know we try to manage here. So big question for you as a caregiver when, when your loved one starts doing something that is like, oh, well, that's new. Um, what are they trying to tell you? Um, a lot of times, a lot of times I will, I will often try taking a person to the bathroom, offering them a snack or directing them to a different activity, you know, sit down with them, look through some photos, do a, you know, bat a balloon back and forth, toss a ball, stand up in the living room and do that. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So behavior wise, those are my, those are my tips is as a caregiver, when you see a behavior arise, um, think to yourself, what is, what, is, what are they trying to tell me right now? Um, so think about those things, pay attention. You know your loved one better than anybody else does. You're with them all the time. You have a, you have a history there. Um, try to figure out what they're trying to tell you. Um, and try try different approaches, um, and per, and and try to be try to persevere through this, and and know that it'll get better. Um, you just have to work real hard to real hard to figure out what they're trying to tell you, um, you know. And if it's a if it's a deeper medical condition, if the behavior doesn't resolve with other interventions, then certainly certainly contact your physician and say, hey, this is what's going on. You're gonna have you're gonna have a list of observations of what's going on. Ask for ask for more help if you need it. If if you're not able to get there yourself or um, other members of your family or friends. Um, so all that being said, that was a lot of information I shared. I hope that some of those tools are helpful. How can we measure the success of, of being good caregivers? Well, one, you're amazing caregivers just because you are doing what you're doing in your own home. Um, but, you know, if your loved one is calm, content, healthy, um, not having behavior, sleeping well at night, things are going well. If, they're, if those things are not um, balanced, then maybe try some of those new tricks, reach out, um, ask more questions of, of other professionals. But um, I thank all of you for being here, for listening, being open to, open to some new things. Um, please try those tricks of the trade and, and please reach out um, if you need anything. You guys can certainly feel free to, to enter questions into our chat uh, chat section down there, or we can certainly answer questions over the phone or via email um, if you'd like to leave that information for us to contact you too. Great. So thank, thank you. you, Sarah. Yeah. A lot of good information. <laughs> a lot of information. Uh, yeah. So we'll take just a couple minutes. If anybody does have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll address it. Um, also, if you're a healthcare provider and would like a CEU, 
for attending this, put your um, email also in the chat room and I'll make sure you'll get a CEU probably within the week um, as I um, like to get the handouts and um, everything all together so I can send it out to you at that time. Um, we will be, as we, as you can see, we recorded this, we will be having the recording available online as well. Um, and a link of that will go out to all that registered too. So you are able to share it with others if you're interested in doing that. So um, I'm going to go to the chat room right now and see if we have any questions. And so far, no questions. Um, I will also put in the chat room, um, Sarah, if you're comfortable with it, just your email. I'll put your email oh, in there. Yeah, so if they do have some questions later on, they can maybe email you specifically. Um, but you can also email me. It's listed there as well on this last slide. Um, if you have any questions, I can absolutely um, pass it along to Sarah too. So. Um, so I'm just going to type Sarah's. All right. Okay. Well, if there's no questions, thank you all for attending. And um, if we have something coming up in the future for 2023, um, you'll be getting an um, email on that too. And if interested, we'll. Um, have you join us at that time too. So thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of the week.